friends. Well, we are going to get started. And as you're joining us, please feel free to introduce in the chat. We're glad you're here. My guest today on the Love in a Big World webinar, I was going to say the Love in a Big World show because it really is a Love in a Big World show for grownups. Um, yeah. I had the kid, I was telling Mika earlier, we did Music City Kids this morning and I'll tell you more about that later. But this is a show just for you and welcome to Jessica from Dallas, Texas. Hope you are safe and dry in Dallas. Um, there is so much going on in our world. We're glad that you took a little time out to join us today. Um, my guest is Mika Jane from Los Angeles, California, and we are talking about SEL and 21st century learning tips, especially given our virtual learning that we're all experiencing together. Uh, aloha, we have Joy joining us from Hawaii and Angie from Southern Indiana, Sherry DeAngelis from Port Charlotte, Florida. We're so glad that you're here. And I'm going to just pass it over to Mika so she can give us a little bit of introduction. And feel free, friends, we will um, engage with you in the chat as we go along. But Mika, please give us a, a bit about you and your background and what brings you to us today. Yeah, um, well, I actually want to start by thanking all of you who are in the, who are participating in this. I know a lot of teachers and educators just began school yesterday. Um, and whether you are teaching um, online or you are in person, I, um, I'm just very grateful for the work that you do. And I hope that today's um, you know, webinar is, is helpful for you all. Um, a little bit about me, I became an educator by way of Teach for America. I was a core member in 2013 in Southside Chicago, where I taught Head Start. Um, so I was teaching itty bitty ones, three, four, and five year olds. And it was there that I really um, became aware of the critical uh, importance of social emotional well being, and not only integrating it into everything that I did as a classroom teacher, but providing those resources to other teachers in my school and to families that we supported in our community. Um, after TFA, I moved to KIPP and I was part of a founding KIPP school here in LA in Watts. Um, and during that time, I basically began uh, our entire character development program, uh, which scaled to several other schools in the region, um, really focusing on values, characters, school wide norms, um, everything from um, our uh, school-wide assemblies to uh, individual growth goals um, with regards to social emotional learning. Um, and most recently, I was at Mind Up, the social emotional learning program of the Goldie Hawn Foundation. It's a CASEL accredited program. Um, I've learned so much from my time at Mind Up, and I'm actually going to begin today with a brain break. Um, it is um, a body scan that I um, I learned from a dear friend and colleague, Sandy. So I'll go ahead and get us started with that. Um, so let's start by taking a few deep, long breaths together. Deep breath in and out. And I'll invite you to gently close your eyes or lower your gaze. Rest your hands gently on your knees or in your lap. Try to keep your upper body straight, tall like a mountain. Let there be a soft smile at the corner of your lips. Bring your awareness to the tip of your tongue and let the tip of your tongue fall. Let it relax. And I'll have us listen to the chime. Keep listening to the chime until you cannot hear the sound anymore. And we'll start by bringing our attention to the forehead. Try to expand the parts of the forehead if they're crunched up a bit and lower your attention to your jaw. See and notice if there's any tension there. Allow the muscles to relax. Focus on your neck, on the, 
throat on the sides and towards the back. Allow the neck to soften. Move down to the shoulders. Be aware of any tension that may be in your shoulders. Feel into the shoulders and breathe into the tension there. The intention of inviting the body to relax is what the state of a relaxed awareness and turning and tuning into how your body feels. That's what this is all about. And one more time, go ahead and listen to the chime until you can't hear the sound anymore and gently open your eyes. Thank you, Mika. I'm always amazed when I take a moment to do that, how in tune I can become with my body and what's going on and also how refreshing it is to take a moment of mindfulness like that. So thank you for that. Um, before we go further, I want to welcome Cynthia from Cookville and everyone again, thank you so much for joining Mika and I today. We're glad you're here. Now, Mika, we're talking about SEL and 21st century learning, and especially how we can adapt our practices for this COVID world in which we're living. Before we go further into the conversation, would you please define for, not, for us, what does asynchronous mean? Absolutely. So I'll start by saying that synchronous learning is learning that's happening at the same time with teachers and students together. So whether you are teaching virtually or you're teaching in person, synchronous learning is, involves every stakeholder. Now, asynchronous learning is everything outside of that. So it accommodates different learning styles. It allows for students to learn when learning is best for them. It allows for reinforcement of content that has already been discussed live. It also is uh, an opportunity to reinforce um, what's already been learned or with the flipped classroom model, provide that first um, kind of initial um, exposure to new content. Um, and I think that with COVID-19 and for many educators who are um, hop, skip and jumping into distance learning that asynchronous content can be really helpful for students to engage in learning um, on their own time. So can you tell us a bit more why the asynchronous learning opportunities matter so much? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, when we think about SEL especially, we're always thinking about relationships over rigor community and connection over content. We know that a child doesn't care what a teacher knows until they know that the teacher cares about them. So when I really think about what synchronous learning time involves, it's building community, it's building relationships, it's learning about your students and having students interact with one another, using the breakout rooms, using the chat feature to allow them to really get a sense of who's in the room. Can I trust these people? What's great about asynchronous learning is that you can really um, gain a lot of understanding about core academic concepts as well as social skills um, that doesn't really require that whole person time. We can have that time be the sacred time that we focus on SEL and building relationships mm -hmm. and allow for all of these asynchronous learning platforms to, um, to help that deeper dive into new content. Great, so tell us, what are some of these asynchronous opportunities that we now have available? Especially given the fact that many of our students have recently been equipped with devices and Wi-Fi access. Yes, and um, it's a great question. And I, um, I'm so happy that students are getting access to the tools that they need to be able to um, to begin the school year virtually. Um, and I know that many educators did not sign up to teach through the internet. Um, so I, again, want to share my gratitude for the work that you're doing. And I, I think that a lot of 
tech companies that are now approaching um, solving this issue are going to come out with incredibly innovative resources. So I'll just share a couple with you and um, we will send uh, a link with all of these resources out to you, uh, to all the participants once this is, um, webinar is concluded. So the first that I wanted to talk about is, um, it's called GRITS. Um, it is an SEL program that's coming out of the Young Adult and Family Center at UCSF, um, the Institute for Neuroscience there. And GRITS is, um, it's a platform through which students can use sketchbooks and breathing balls that are virtual. So I have here a physical breathing ball. You deep breath in and deep breath out that teachers can use with students. But on this website, GRITS, G-R-I-T-Z, excuse me, G-R-I-T-X, org a student can actually create their own visual breathing ball you can set a certain number of seconds for deeping deep breaths in and out you can set the music you can set the ambiance um, and it's all free these are resources that a student can use on their own so a teacher can choose to show the entire class in a whole group um, and then send the link out for parents and, pe and students to utilize on their own. Um, another amazing resource is called Flipgrid, which has, I wanna say between 50 to 100 million users, um, pre-K pre teachers all the way through PhD um, candidates. Um, and it's Microsoft's um, video discussion platform. So the way that Flipgrid works is you can, as an educator, you can share a question, you can read a story, um, you can really prompt any um, dialogue. And through Flipgrid, students are able to record their responses. That allows for a child to record it on their time. It doesn't require that they do it live with all their peers watching. As we know, every child is unique and a lot of students who might be a little bit uh, more introverted may not want to, um, speak in a whole group space or even use the chat feature. Um, so I think it's really important that we have the opportunity for students to actually film themselves or record their voice um, to be able to submit as, um, you know, as we look at play-based learning and alternative ways to um, assess student knowledge. And then um, there are just so many other platforms I can think of, but um, one that I think is important to share is, um, so there's, there's this whole um, movement around digital literacy and ensuring that we are giving our students um, knowledge of what misinformation is and how to know when you're coming across something that's not true. Um, and there is one organization National Literacy Project that I think is doing an excellent job at providing digital literacy videos and webinars and medium articles that are just written out um, and infographics, you know, for those who like to scroll through social media and visually like to see images that help students to understand what digital literacy is. And they have um, courses for pre-K all the way through high school. So every child of any age can learn about this content and teachers don't have to take that ownership on. Um, I'll also say, um, you know, that the why it matters uh, as a millennial, um, I feel that my generation has been so innovative in regards to growing up with the internet, um, medical advancement, tech advancement, and I worry about this coming generation with the pandemic um, really cutting into their socialization opportunities and getting to know other peers who are their age. And so with, um, with online learning and internet, um, teaching over the internet becoming such a big part of our students' lives, um, I, I just, um, I want for, for every teacher to have the knowledge and the resources to be able to create content that kids can access at, a, at, at times when it's best for them. That's great. So Mika, I'm, I'm thinking about several things at the same time. First of all, thanks for sharing these resources. And we wanna get into how we can connect these resources to regular routines 
and um, in just a moment. But you you raised an interesting question. The the fact that you are a millennial. Um, we talked a few weeks ago when we were preparing for this for this time together that you and I are from different generations, and so our perspective of learning today is different, and and our perspective of learning is even different from the current students' perspective of learning, given the fact that they are digital natives from birth. So what, from your perspective as a millennial, how might you encourage or support um, older teachers who have had maybe more classroom experience but don't, do not feel as confident with these digital tools that you're sharing? That's a great, uh, it's a great question. And without, um, without trying to provide more websites to go to and more resources, um, I do think that the shift to self-guided learning, the shift to um, a type of learning where students have access to content through Google Classroom, through Zoom, through um, newsletters, through their one-on-one -on -one time that they have with their teachers, um, that broadening how students get, um, get access to content will really benefit the teacher as well. Just in the same way that social emotional learning is not just for educators, um, it is uh, excuse me, it's not just for students, it's for teachers, it's for parents. Um, SEL can, can change lives. Um, and it's, um, it's important that we utilize things like feeling wheels and um, check-ins every day, you know, the fist to five check-in. That is a very simple one that is visual for our students. It's something you can do daily, it's something that students can facilitate as well once um, that routine is built. Um, and those are things that don't have to happen with the entire classroom. Um, another resource though that I do think is often not talked about enough is read alouds on YouTube. If you are looking for multicultural curriculum books, resources, if you're looking for SEL specific books, there are lots of YouTube videos that are free that have the entire book that you can just click start and then you can read or have your students read. Um, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I've actually been teaching um, reading enrichment um, over the summer um, with Treehouse Learning, um, co-founded by Teach for America alumni. And, um, you know, part of the reason that I, uh, that I know now how exhausting it is to teach over Zoom is because I'm doing it. And um, it is so hard to get children to stay attentive for over 30 minutes and that's just one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, and so i think that being able to lean on youtube and flipgrid and all these other um, tools um, it not only helps the teacher but it's really engaging for the student um, go noodle activities um, you know starfall these are websites sites that are free um, and they um, it, it allows for students to stay engaged and to, to switch things up so it's not so much of the teacher talking and becoming exhausted. That's great and Latoya asked if we can get these resources um, sent to you and the answer is yes we will be providing links to all the resources that Mika and I talked about today in a follow-up email for you. All right, so Mika, how do we integrate this into a daily routine? All of these different resources that you're mentioning um, related to SEL, that's, that's the question on the table. And, and before we dig into that, I do wanna say one thing. If you, if you were with us a few minutes ahead of time, um, Mika and I were talking about the unrealistic expectation that many schools and districts have right now Mm -hmm. having children sign on for the entire school day. And I just, I, this is something I am passionate about. So I'm going to share it and then, and then let Mika dive into the integration piece. Uh, if you essentially, what we've done is we've transitioned students from in school to homeschool. 
If you look at homeschool guidelines, even by the Association of Superintendents, we need to understand that the expectations are very different because time is used differently. So for early childhood and early elementary, we're looking at one to two hours of learning a day. For middle grades, it's about two to three hours. For high school, it's about three to four hours. So it's very unrealistic for us to think that a second grader is going to sit on Zoom for seven hours. That is not going to be helpful to them and it's not going to be helpful for the teacher as well. So when we're talking about this integration of resources, we need to understand that asynchronous learning is just as viable as synchronous learning, like Nick is talking about. And we need to embed these SEL activities, mindfulness, brain breaks, all of that into what happens synchronously so that kids can stay energized and attentive for whatever they're doing synchronously or asynchronously. So Mika, what tips do you have about this integration? I, I totally agree with your point that you made just now. And um, when it, with regards to how to integrate the resources, um, you know, there are many ways to go about this. Um, one thing that I've always believed is that SEL standalone, like understanding one's emotions, being able to respond to what they feel, how that impacts their relationships with others and the way they make decisions, um, that SEL shouldn't only be a curriculum or it shouldn't only be mindfulness done on Mondays or journaling done on Tuesdays. That, um, that doesn't really capture the, the magnitude of what SEL is. So uh, um, while I think that a lot of curriculum resources and a lot of the Castle accredited programs um, do provide a lot of knowledge that without that actual practice, um, curriculum can just collect dust on a shelf often. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that, but I, I think the easiest way that I could think of to start, particularly if you're a little bit nervous about creating content on your own, would be um, to, join, to join Twitter. Look at the education chats that are happening. You can search for the hashtag edu chat. Um, ED Twitter. Um, there are educators from all over the world who are communicating online with one another right now, sharing resources, learning about uh, challenges that other areas are facing within the US and around the world. And I just, um, I cannot stress enough how valuable the teacher and educator community is. Um, I myself am pretty active on Twitter and I'm, I'm finding that um, there are resources that I'd never heard of that are coming up as a result of this pandemic, resources that are created for and by teachers. Um, so I think that, that that is a great place to start, particularly if um, you know, there's some nervousness. And the other thing I would say, just given that it's the first week of school, um, academic content may not be being taught at this very moment for a lot of schools and uh, classrooms. Um, thinking about getting to know you games, thinking about um, making it a theme, like for example, a Netflix themed getting to know you where you ask children, um, you know, if you could watch any show or you could binge watch any show, what would it be and why? Um, what character do you align most with or who do you see yourself in? Um, in a show that you've watched? What snacks would you eat while you binge watch that show? You know, really going beyond the traditional, what is your name? How old are you? What's your favorite food? And, and kind of learning about children in a way that, that they are, they might be more interested in responding to. I love that. Anytime that we can use pop culture to make that connection with kids, I think it's a win. So what about routines, Nika? What, what suggestions do you have for routines? Well, I mean, it, it really depends on how long your um, time with students is, you know, whether it's in person for a couple of hours or over Zoom. One thing that I did with my students um, throughout my career as an educator was I started with 
um, well, for the youngest learners, I started with the morning circle. And I really let the children um, or the students um, kind of moderate that morning circle. Initially, it was me asking a check-in question, like, you know, a motivational Monday or a wacky Wednesday, things like that. But, um, you know, that can be done virtually. That can be done um, with a slide that shows every child the prompt and allows for every child to interact with that prompt, either through the chat, through, um, you know, sharing over Zoom, or through sending you a note separately. Um, I think that that's a great way to give students voice um, and letting them decide how they want to respond and if they want to respond. And another um, part of building in SEL into your routine is really listening without needing to respond. We need to normalize not bringing up an experience that we've had uh, based on what we're hearing someone else say. We just need to be able to listen to them. Um, and I, I think that a lot of students right now, maybe they have been heard all summer long, but maybe they haven't. And maybe as an educator, we are that adult who is there for them and able to provide that support and the knowledge that, you know, we are listening, we hear you. Um, that is such a big part of SEL. And if that can be built into the routine, whether it's checking in once a week with each of your students, or if that's not feasible, um, you know, checking in in small groups, and, and then knowing that they can look forward to that time with their teacher, um, I think that is just absolutely critical. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is intentionality and making sure that we build into our schedules that intentionality, um, whether it's a whole group, one-on-one, -on -one, small group, so we can have the conversations we need to have with our kiddos. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So Jessica is asking about a recording of this webinar. Yes, um, there will be a link provided to you as well as all of the resources that Mika and I have been talking about. In our few closing moments, I'm wondering if there's any questions that you have for Mika and, and me about um, these tips. So if you have a question, go ahead and add that to the chat. I am just so grateful that you're sharing your experiences, Mika, and your, and your wisdom, because you're coming at this not just from an SEL perspective, but also a classroom teacher perspective and, a, and an administrative leadership perspective, which I think is really helpful to have that breadth of experience because you know the practicalities and logistics of implementation, which I think is still one of the biggest obstacles that people have. They, they talk about, oh, how am I gonna fit this into my day when I have all these other things to do? And given um, the fact that we're on Zoom so much for learning, I think people are still trying to figure out how do I make this work logistically? So here's a question from Linda. What would be a recommended routine for early childhood students? I'll answer this in two ways. One, if you're in person and one, if you're teaching um, over Zoom or Google Classroom or something like that. Um, so I think, you know, being able to use visuals, like having a poster with expectations, being able to check off, like, okay, we've done our breathing with our breathing ball. We've done a two minute guided meditation or a brain break using our chime. These types of visuals help students really stay engaged. Once a teacher is talking for too long and a child loses engagement, it is so easy for them to just close the laptop screen or open up another lap, uh, tab on their computers. I've seen it happen over the summer with the students I was working with, and it required incorporating literally everything I could offer them in terms of my engagement um, to, uh, to ensure that they participated. Um, and on that note, I want to um, shift our language and our thinking from attending, like attendance, to participants. 
participating in the learning. So it goes far beyond whether you are attending or you've arrived at school or you've arrived into the Zoom. Um, it's really about incorporating ways for the child to engage, whether it's an introverted child or an extroverted child or what have you student. Um, so, you know, another thing with early childhood, um, one of the students I was working with was four and a half. Um, so right in that sweet spot of ECE. And, um, you know, I had to learn a lot about what interested him. Um, he really liked dinosaurs. So I found lots of books on dinosaurs on YouTube. Um, I used Canva, which is a design platform. Um, Canva is really great for, um, you know, creating these simple Instagram like um, designs. Um, and I would share that with him and his family during times that I wasn't even working with him. So we talked about the five finger retail, right? Like, who are the characters in the story? What's the setting of the story? What happens at the beginning, the middle and the end? And as a four and a half year old, he now can tell you what's the five finger retail strategy. And all it required was me teaching it once to him and then sending him the visual that I made on Canva so that he could have that on his own to keep reinforcing that learning. Um, so I think that when a student knows that they're learning something new, but they also know that they're going to receive that asynchronous content to further their development, it, it allows for there to be less anxiety and stress over that very specific time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the last thing with regards to whether you're in person or virtual is um, having an opportunity for students to interact with one another. This is often the hardest thing. Some teachers will have their, you know, have the Zoom breakout rooms open um, with, you know, before, or have the Zoom start before um, the teacher arrives. It, it really is, there's such a fine line on how you do that, but giving, giving kids the opportunity to speak to one another, I think is really important in building relationships. Mm -hmm. So we have a few more questions coming in. Are you okay if we have a few more minutes? Surely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and friends, we're so glad you're here and we're going to try to get to your questions in the next few minutes. So the next is as an out of school time provider, trying not to overwhelm students with more virtual time, what would you recommend for the best quick SEL intervention for students? Yes, that's a great one. And I, I have my go-to answer, which is, it's called the how do you really feel poster. Um, mm -hmm. So it has, it's, it actually is um, from a social work textbook, but it has lots of different feelings written out with visuals. And I'll add this to the resource list that we send out. Um, it's available in Spanish as well, just as an FYI. Um, and it allows for kids to really understand um, what different emotions and synonyms for emotions that we know going far beyond happy, sad, mad. Um, it allows them to answer um, what they really are feeling on that given day. And, you know, as an out of school provider, I, um, if I'm, if I'm understanding your question, right, uh, Megan, it, it, it is really hard to, to really, and to really know what a student is feeling on a given day, but making sure to ask them intentionally, not assuming that just because you talked to them yesterday or a week ago, that they're feeling the same thing. Sometimes I hear adults will say, how are you today? Oh, I'm good. But how are you really feeling? That question allows for a much deeper answer. Um, and I've been trying to do that with, with the, uh, the people that I'm speaking to, but I think kids will really actually open up and be willing to share if they're asked. Just to add on to that, I would, another question that I have found useful is to ask, how is your heart today? Which at first is usually like, what do you mean? My heart is fine. It's pumping. But if you, you know, dig a little deeper, how is your heart today? Like how, again, how are you really feeling? It's just another way to phrase that. Um, they'll usually tune in to what's really going on. And, and I think the other part of it is to remember that we as caring adults are modeling SEL for them all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like what Mika was saying early, earlier, we want the explicit 
activities or explicit instruction around SEL, but we also want that integration piece. So it's not just like, oh, I did my SEL moment for the day, but this is how I approach learning. This is how I approach out of school time. This is how I approach everything that we do in a caring and nurturing way so that kids know that, that what they do and say matters. Um, a couple more questions. How do you feel about morning check-in uh, just being able to let kids talk openly amongst themselves like they would at breakfast time. I know you mentioned this just a little bit, but if you could expand on that, that'd be great. Of course. And I, I love the question. Um, what I think is the most challenging about that is there's usually one very chatty student who will really <laughs> take over um, just the same way that we have that in adult groups where there's one person who has a lot to say you know, they're the child who, you know, in a room full of students, they would want to learn everyone's story. They'd want to talk to every child and learn about them. Um, and that can sometimes take over. Um, but that said, I think that with the right prompts, um, allowing students the time to, to talk amongst themselves um, is really valuable. It just has to be done in a way that um, allows for, especially with younger students, for there to be an adult present. Mm -hmm. And I think practically speaking, John, another would be just set the timer and say, okay, you've got 10 minutes before we officially begin our class and you want to come and hang out and to have your talk time. There you go. Yeah. But letting them know that this is a defined time for them to connect in that way, I think would be really helpful. Last question. How can specialists, art, PE, music, use SEL with their students in remote learning? Yeah. Um, well, I'll start with um, I'll start with physical education. Um, you know, in the Mind Up curriculum, there's a lot. Um, there's a whole lesson, two lessons, in fact, on mindful movement, and um, you know, even something as simple as um, you know the eight seven six five four three two one, and then doing it with both arms and both legs, and really getting uh, students' bodies moving. Um, it gives them the opportunity to get kind of that, those endorphins up. Endorphins are one of the happy chemicals um, and, and gives them the, uh, the feeling that they're doing something together. Um, and when you sit down, you can ask students, how does your heart feel? Is it racing? What does that mean? You know, and really getting a sense of um, how can I integrate these skills, mindfulness, social, emotional, the neuroscience, mind what is happening to our brain and our bodies and and beginning to share that with kiddos um, I think four years of age or five would be the earliest that I would say you know you could actually start talking to them about the amygdala and the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex um, mind up does a great job with this but there are lots of other curriculum out there that um, that also get into this um, and then with music I actually um, I studied music and I um, I, I think there are a lot of ways uh, to share songs with kids that incorporate sharing and collaboration, things that are so hard to um, assess. There's so few uh, curricula out there that actually um, are able to capture data around what is SEL in action? What does it look like? What does it sound like? How can I, um, how can I really see it in action? Um, but songs really help. So um, I would encourage any music or art teacher to incorporate, um, you know, singing and a little bit of movement um, using uh, using the SEL uh, concepts. And I'll share some um, some links in the in the information I provide. This is great, Mika. Thank you so much for your time. And friends, we will be sharing a recording of this webinar as well as the resources that Mika's mentioned, as well as a few from love in a big world, please be sure to follow us. We've already shared this webinar on our Facebook page on love in a big world, but you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter as well. Um, we're here to support you. I think one of the things, although this is an extremely difficult time for all of us, one of the things that I am most grateful for is that we are in this together. So please know that Mika and I are here to best support you as you support children and families and, and your colleagues as well. So thank you so much, Mika, you are delightful. And I hope that you'll come back and join us again soon. Hope you all have a wonderful day and make it 
a time for all of us to love in a big world because love conquers fear. And I'll tell you, uh, I think that's what we need a lot more of right now. So again, thanks so much and we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.